Oh, hey, you've hit the button. I hit the button. Calling right. Chris Anderson in London. Chris Anderson is in London and calling Rick Byer in Chicago. I am in Chicago, where today it is 70 degrees out. People want to Kind of yucky for early March, but right. we're making do as best we can. Sure. And I want to say, hey, I want to say welcome to everybody uh, to Absolutely. History Happy Hour. Yeah, thanks to Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours for bringing you this show. Check out their Rich Offering of Military History Tours at stephenambrosetours.com. You'll be leaving soon, right? You're like two weeks away from or something. Oh, like a week range. away. Like a week away yeah. from going to the starting the Pacific tour. So the Pacific know, tour. Wow. So that'll be uh, amazing. Uh, guys, whether you're watching live, whether you're watching on replay or listening to the HHH podcast, oh. we are glad you're here. And today we'll be talking about a most fascinating uh, figure from American history, uh, Benedict Arnold. Uh, so... Yes. Uh, we can maybe maybe we'll have divided opinions, or maybe we'll have uh, maybe we'll be more united than you think. I don't know. Let us know that you're out there and what you are drinking. We hope you are drinking something on this lovely Sunday. And Chris, I want to thank, and I'm sure that you do too, everybody who supports us on Patreon. Uh, oh, question. Especially our <coughs> top shelf patrons. I sent out a few hats. I know that. Uh, hey, yeah, yeah, I got. It. Morrison got a hat and Marcus Boyd got a hat. And so, you know, and there's more hats in the hat box if you want to become a top shelf patron. And you can do that at patreon.com slash history happy hour. And you can drink some of that fine top shelf brew there. I don't know what that is, but, yeah, I don't know. you know, it's a mystery. It's been a mystery <laughs> for years <laughs> and the mystery continues. Mouthwash. Yeah. So, so Chris, is there anybody out there in the world of there are, viewers? And, yeah, there are it? quite a few. Uh, Ken is uh, coming in from Kansas. Uh, George Luz has joined us again. George Luz. Uh, yeah. Okay. And uh, a certain Catherine Byer Hurst. Are you familiar uh -huh. with her? Well, there's Chris Jackson. We see, I haven't seen Chris in a while, I don't think. Maybe, Chris, you've been here and we just haven't seen you. I don't know. John Leonard, Ted Moon, Colette Harold Corva. Yeah. Harold Boltz. Patrick Niles, uh, yeah. So we're getting a good crowd. Yeah, we got I got lots of people. We got eighty people so far live. So we can't really um, read all those <laughs> names. Or we would, we would just be here, be here all day. Um, um, so uh, I think. Uh, 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 do you have any news, or are we ready uh, to go to the show? I think we should go. You've already mentioned that I'm going to the Pacific. Uh, you've got something happening soon. I am. We are two and a half weeks away from the Ghost Army Gold Medal ceremony, but uh, that's going to happen. Say about that, yeah, it's going to yeah. happen. They, the government has moved their default deadline or whatever. So oh, yeah. I think we, we think we're in good shape. But, but knock on wood, we'll see how that works out. So I give me a cue. And we'll, we'll, we will do a full report, although it may come a couple of weeks late since we have a bunch of weeks of Encore episodes. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. We'll talk about yeah, that. yeah, we'll figure it out. We'll All get right. something right. up there. All right. All right. The bar is open. The bar is open. And Chris, um, Benedict Arnold. Yes. Yes. He was one of America's very best soldiers until the moment yes. that he either committed treason or renounced his Most treason, of, yeah. depending yeah. on your point of view. Just depending on your point of view. And I know your point of view <laughs> is that he renounced <laughs> his treason. Uh, his military actions laid the groundwork for our independence, and then he switched sides. And to talk about this most striking, I might add bewildering, you might have a different adjective, figure in American history, we welcome back award-winning historian and author Jack Kelly. And Jack is the author of a new book about Benedict Arnold uh, called, do I, ooh, I don't think I have the cover right here. Do you have the book in your hand? I, I do. Well, let me get it. I've got it right I, here. I'm, I'm embarrassed to say I thought I had the graphic here and I can't find it. So we have to hold it up. But here, we'll, we'll get, we'll hang on, keep it up there. We get, yes, God there Save go. Benedict Arnold, okay, is the title of his new book, The Story, The True Story of America's Most Hated Man. And we are joined by Jack Kelly on his second 
History Happy Hour. Yeah. It's been two and a half years, almost three years, Jack, since you joined us previously. Yeah, my previous book uh, was uh, Val Coor, the 1776 campaign that saved the cause of liberty. So that's very smooth. Uh, also in the Benedict Arnold um, promo there. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so Kristen. Oh, you've, so you've, you've been with Benedict then the whole time since yeah, the show? You're, you're in the fan uh, club. Pretty much, yeah, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, did you bring a drink today, uh, yeah, Chad? Yeah, uh, I've got a in my Johnny Carson uh, coffee mug. I've got uh, some. Um, Let's see your coffee mug, Johnny Carson coffee mug. It's it's a plain it's, coffee it's, it's mug. It's a nice, I see. Yeah. Okay. Oh, if I'm, anybody I'm, that remembers Johnny Carson always said it's only coffee, enough. but it was always um, yeah. something uh, else. <laughs> so I'm drinking Valcour Brewing uh, uh, brew from up in Valcour Brewing in Plattsburgh, New York, which is. Um, Right near where the Just Battle of Elk Island was. Yeah. So, and it yeah. also is the, the breweries in an old army barracks. So, so, so. Chris, what about you? Are you drinking uh, today? I've got my uh, Glen Turret 12. So. Nice. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm drinking a Samuel Adams. I oh. went for somebody who didn't switch sides. Okay. <laughs> well, you could say that he did, but we'll get into that, I'm sure. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so right. So you wrote about. The Battle of Alcor Island. You wrote about Benedict Arnold, and then for a new book, you decided to write about Benedict Arnold again. So, Jack, what uh, makes him so fascinating that for you the first book was not enough? Well, I think um, one thing I always bring up, uh, Rick, is the redemption factor. And if you if you think about Benedict Arnold as a baseball player, he's the guy. We always think of the um, the player who strikes out three times and then hits a home run in the bottom of the ninth and is redeemed and he is, becomes the hero. Uh, but we never think about the guy who hits the home run in the first two innings and then strikes out in the bottom of the ninth and <laughs> loses a game for his team. He's the mutt of the game. And so why did it? Why is he any worse than the guy who did it in the opposite um, order? That was Benedict Arnold. If he'd if he'd started out as a loyalist and then come over and done what he did, uh, he would still be one of our greatest heroes. But uh, he did it in the wrong order. Uh, well, uh, uh, so he's he, honestly he, he didn't just strike out in the ninth thing. He he went to the other team's dugout and he hit you know tried to hit a home run for them. Benedict Arnold down the stadium. stadium. Okay. <laughs> And anyway, we've lost Chris because we're talking about yeah, baseball. So he's yeah, like, oh, yeah, you've completely it. lost me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but anyway, but, you know, I think that I, I think the, what really attracted me to to Arnold was the story of his life, and I just re really wanted to get across the story and particularly the achievements. And I felt that uh, in a lot of the the histories of the Revolutionary War, his he uh, Arnold was like the black hole of American history, he, and he warped space around himself. So when people recounted the things he did, they diminished them, they distorted them, they questioned his motives, um, and distorted history. And I, and I really, really felt that by telling the, just the direct story of what Benedict Arnold did, uh, it was putting those a little bit more back in place, those stories of uh, Ticonderoga and uh, uh, Valcour Island, which I'd, I'd already covered, and particularly in, in the Battle of Saratoga, which I think Arnold's participation in is finally being recognized for what it was. Right. So, Jack, I mean, because I think, you know, one of the impressions I have is that because he's become the big boogeyman of the revolution um, and have, people have, you know, made all kinds of assertions about him and he's just, he's just all kind of taken on his story taken on a life of its own i don't know if people really know enough about just kind of where he comes from so just just to kind of set the scene tell us a little bit about where he's coming from and, and you know what his background is yeah he was uh from uh, a fairly well-to-do family or a, a comfortable middle-class family in uh what uh eastern connecticut and his father was in the shipping business and an international trader but um, became an alcoholic and the, the family business went downhill and his father became really the town drunk. Uh, his mother was a, um, a rather severe uh, Puritan and uh, he had a fairly rough childhood after that. He had to, he had to leave school. He, he got a, 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 um, 
he's often referred to as an apothecary, which I think gives a bad, uh, gives a, a kind of a d distorted view of him. The apothecary business in the, those days was re really um, high-end goods, luxury good trading. Uh -huh. uh, and he did work as an apprentice for, you know, this seven to nine years of apprenticeship and then um, started his, his own trading business in New Haven and uh, was quite successful at it. But in the process, get, you know, he was one of those people on the waterfront that really had um, um, a um, contact with the British impositions and the taxes and the, um, the various um, uh, problems of just trading in the mercantile system uh, and became a patriot because of that. And it was a pretty rough guy on the, on the waterfront. Also a ship's captain. So, you know, being a ship's captain, um, you know, it was a very, uh, you had to be a, uh, have a kind of commanding personality. Mm -hmm. He didn't have any military training to speak of, uh, but was like two days after the news of Lexington Concord reached um, uh, New Haven, he marched off to war, went to Boston, uh, met Joseph Warren there, was sent out to um, uh, Western Massachusetts to raise, raise a regiment and take over Fort Ticonderoga, which uh, that was his first big achievement was the uh, capture of Fort Ticonderoga. So he captures Fort Ticonderoga with uh, with with Ethan Allen, or Ethan Allen captures it with Benedict Arnold, depending on your point of view. Uh, and so this is kind of this is kind of this is kind of his big start, and he comes back to to uh, to Boston. Uh, and he meets with George Washington. And you say that they bonded right away. And I'm curious, um, you know, Washington is really a big fan of Arnold's right up until mm, that thing that happens five years later. Uh, what is it that ties them together? And how, how in what ways, uh, what, what did Washington say or do that we kind of know he was a Benedict Arnold, uh, you know, fanboy? Well, I think the first thing was that he, um, Washington at that time was in the process of forming the Continental Army, and he immediately made um, Arnold, who had, like I said, had very little military experience, was, he named him a colonel and gave him a thousand men to go to do, to march over the mountains of Maine uh, up to attack Quebec. So um, that in itself, there's really no record of the back and forth between Washington and Arnold. Uh, I, I sometimes, and perhaps going on a limb a little bit, make the analogy of Eisenhower and Patton, where Eisenhower is the sort of uh, political general and uh, Patton is the fighting general. And um, that was a somewhat, I would say it's an imperfect analogy, but it's somewhat the case with Washington and Benedict Arnold. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, well, Jack, one of the things that really struck me um, and I kind of like to get your thoughts on even at that early stage. I mean, he's not a military man, but, but you notice in the, some of the steps he takes that he's really kind of concerned about professionalism and doing things in a proper military manner. Like, you know, when he joins the revolution, he just doesn't join the militia. He forms a militia company. They hire a former British soldier to drill them. Uh, what is it about him that I mean, he just seems to be like a step ahead in, in, uh, you know, I think it was. I, I think the origin of his um, of his abilities as a as a military officer was from his being a ship's captain. I, I you know, I think that uh, the the attention to detail, the attention to planning, the uh, assertion of your your command over the crew on your ship, uh, the, um, the the threats of piracy, the rough. Um, um, atmosphere that he ran into down in the West Indies all prepared him. Uh, but I think it's even that's hard to explain how he became what he became. And I think that he himself, to a certain extent, was surprised uh, at what a gift he had for military thinking. It was just uh -huh. somehow he his mind worked in that fashion and both strategically because he, he always did keep the um, the big picture in mind yeah. as well as uh, uh, as tactical tactically uh, managing battles and 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 managing and uh, got along with his men his subordinates very well uh, not quite as quite as uh, friendly relations with people that were 
not under him, but he was trying to <laughs> he was cooperate, with, cooperate yeah. with anybody. Was, yeah. Well, you said something in the book that really struck me. Um, and you said that Benedict Arnold was not a thoughtful man. But this wasn't a slap at him. This is you trying to get at a fundamental part of his character. And can you explain what you meant and why it was important? Well, I think that um, it's hard, and, and I don't I mean this as a criticism, but I think it's hard for all of us, and particularly for more academic historians, to get to get what a, a man of, who, somebody who's just a man of action, what he's all about. Somebody who does not, is not introspective, never thinks about what he's thinking about, uh, but all is just, uh, goes and 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 acts he he's, he was a uh, uh, impulsive but usually did the right thing when he had the impulse and um we don't see it in a, the the few letters that he left behind uh he, he certainly didn't keep a diary or a, any um, of the rumination he didn't try to you know keep leave behind a record of his military service um, the way Washington did, um, it, it was strictly everything was in the moment and 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 acting, um, and he found that that was where his gift lay, lay and he he went with it. Yeah. Now, I, you know, and, and Rick mentioned we, he he's kind of central to uh, the taking of Fort Ticonderoga. Um, uh, he comes back and he's he's made a bit of a name for himself at this point. But then I think probably one of the the events that kind of he's best or well known for most well known for is the attempt to take Canada. Um, so it, first of all, I mean, tell us a little bit about that, his part in all that. Um, and I know this is a little bit of Monday morning quarterbacking, but do you think that this is a realistic objective or is he just wildly impetuous at this point? Well, it's it's a it's another one of those one what ifs of history. Uh, Arnold actually wrote out a plan, and um, discussed the plan and sent it down to uh, Congress of how they could immediately attack um, and capture uh, Canada. And he'd found out that there was fewer than four hundred British troops in all of Canada. Not and they were spread out. A lot of them were out in the uh, frontier forts. It was going to be an easy, um, an easy job if they moved quickly. And after he proposed it, you know, first co Congress uh, initially wanted to give back even for Tech and Roga. They didn't want to. They <laughs> they wanted, they were, sorry, sorry, uh, <laughs> Britain. We'll give you back Canada, Ticonderoga, whatever. If we can just yeah, they were, they were going to keep. They were going to keep a few cannon, but they they said make sure you get the serial numbers on the cannon. So we're <laughs> there. But uh, they didn't move quickly. They got Philip Schuyler, who was a very deliberate guy, and and spent a lot of time planning and felt that that was the way to go. And it, and it was weeks and then months before they got the show going. Um, and then they appointed Richard Montgomery, who I, I, I got the feeling, and I haven't really, I'm not re totally versed in Montgomery, but he's very popular around where I live because he was from here, that Montgomery was a, had a limited uh, talent as a, as a military officer, he um, did not do well in getting and moving quickly. He even things slowed down even more under Montgomery. And he had he was had been a British officer, but he got up to St. John's and and managed a very poorly uh, uh, rickety siege of St. John's that went on week after week after week, and then finally took Montreal. Didn't get up to to Quebec City until December and it was already then pretty hard core winter up there and then had to make the decision should he attack or not uh, to, to capture Quebec and he decided to capture it. I think that was a big mistake. I think that he should have taken on his own initiative even though his orders were to, to try to take it. He should have taken on his initiative, his own initiative and say, you know, we did the best we could. Let's 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 cut our losses. But instead, he attacked. He was killed, and and 
I think 400 and some of his men were taken prisoner. Yeah. And that was, and Benedict Arnold, of course, was also uh, wounded in that battle. Um, and so um, that was the invasion of Canada, which we don't like to talk about very much. Uh, well, and, but one uh, part, I, and, and, and one part we've, we've kind of skipped over, and, it, and it's an important part, is that Benedict Arnold leads thousand men up from Boston. They go by ship up to Maine, and then they, they are going to march through the wilderness. And Maine, they have boats, and so they're going to take the boats, but they're, they've got a portage. They've got to do stuff. And this turns, can you talk a little bit about this journey? Because it is it is beautifully captured in the 1930 Kenneth Roberts novel, Arundel. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is an epic, I mean, I just to read about it, reading about it again in your book, I mean, it, it's unbelievable the kind of the hardships that they go through. Yeah, I, I think about probably half the Benedict Arnold fans that I've met have been fans also of Kenneth Roberts and, the, and that book and his other books about the revolution. And Roberts did uh, did a exemplary job of researching, before, you know, even though it was historical fiction. He went and he actually published all the uh, I, I have di it. Nice. diaries. Right. Uh, he published the all man. the diaries of the people who were who were there, so you can yeah. you can read that through yourself. Uh, so um, whether that was a good idea, uh, you know, Arnold ha had the idea. Other people had had that idea. They knew that there was this track that went through there. Uh, they not only they they got the boats. They mostly the boats were to 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 take their equipment and provisions. Uh, because they spent most of their time wading through ice water, pushing those boats upstream. Um, very difficult. Um, and um, it was, they were going into the unknown. If you look at the bigger picture, I don't know that that uh, expedition is as heroic as it was. And it really showed up Benedict Arnold at his best in many ways, because the, the lives of these thousand men were on his shoulders. They got out so far up that they couldn't go back because they didn't have enough provisions to go back and they're running out of food and then they didn't know what was ahead. And he went ahead and got the provisions and saved the and uh, saved his entire army and got them down there and, and almost you know had a chance of taking this. But without cannon, it was a little hard to take a, a city that had you know 20 foot walls all around it. So um, that was really on George Washington. I mean, it was George Washington authorized that. Uh, and he always, particularly in early in the war, I think George Washington always liked a little complication in his plans rather than just, uh, Arnold would have been better off going with Montgomery up Lake Champlain and then up the, because they, they ended up at the same place. And um, if he'd done that and if he'd pushed it along a little bit, I think they would have been they might, have, off, but they might have captured the British general. They might have taken Quebec. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. And, and as, a, as it turned out, the, it, it just, just to finish that up, it just as it turned out, the, the British sent over their reinforcements. And when they got there in the spring, everything collapsed. And yeah. um, the 200-mile the retreat back to Fort Ticonderoga began. Well, but, you know, there's a lot. Um, well, obviously, it, it, Arnold's command during the, the the march up, and and you could say that his command during the siege was was exemplary. There are also some elements of it where you start to see some of those tensions um, amongst his subordinates or his his other commanders. Um, so I'd be interested to know like uh, how he's how he's working with other people in this whole situation. If that gives you any indication of of his as, as an officer, and, and how how does his reputation survive? what happens in Canada because you know you, you could have been that could have been could have been it well he his uh, his uh, contribution to the invasion of Canada really was a success I mean he did get that army up there they didn't they didn't um, uh, weren't able to capture on their own but uh, he had then to wait for Montgomery to come up and Montgomery right. had a much bigger force and a much easier a path to get there, and yet uh, was a, a, a lot slower. So I don't think it really hurt his, uh, Arnold's reputation. Right. In fact, he came out of it really a celebrity. He was by that when he came back, he was almost as uh, well known as, as Washington himself. Um, it, it did show him up to be a very prickly character, and um, and 
he didn't suffer fools lightly and he uh, had a hard time getting along with people and being diplomatic, particularly under stress. And, you know, he'd, he felt he'd laid out, he laid out his own money to, to pay the troops and to buy supplies when they're up there. And, um, he was criticized for, um, his kind of negligence in handling things when it, he didn't feel was that was his fault at all right. so that was the beginning of him he he made a lot of enemies all through the war and that was really the beginning of it yeah well in in february of 1776 after the battle of quebec arnold is passed over for promotion to major general i think there's four other people who are junior to him who are promoted major general and this is probably the start of his the beef he has with Congress, which will grow and 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 end up leading him to uh, to treason. So why is he passed over? How did he react? I, I looked into quite detail about that um, uh, problem in the in the army. The the, the Congress had um, great fear of a standing army. That the that there were two large uh, forces in the country and one was the Continental Army and one was Congress and Continental Army was a lot bigger and a lot more powerful and they were afraid of just getting pushed aside and having Washington take over and the the army take over as they'd seen happen in history down the years so they uh, one of their ways of keeping control of the army was to control all the, the major uh, promotions and th then the question was well how do we decide who's going to get promoted. And they didn't want to acknowledge entirely that really it was George Washington and the other top officers who knew the people and, and knew who to promote. Uh, so they said, no, it's going to be according to merit, but it's also going to be according to your background and who do you know? And then there's going to be so many per state, uh, depending on how many um, troops your state has contributed to the cause and that and then john adams essentially said well it's going to be all those things and so that just pretty much threw it into into the realm of politics and um the the uh technical reason that arnold didn't get promoted even though he, he and uh george washington and nathaniel green all agreed they deserved a promotion was that uh, there was already two major generals from connecticut and that was a very flimsy excuse, but um, I sort of got a little bit of sympathy for John Adams because he was basically the what would we would think of as the Secretary of Defense during the war. Plus, he was on twenty other committees and going to Congress for the regular business of Congress, and he was trying to run the military for everything from buying bullets to promoting generals. So. Um, it was a tough job, and he, uh, I think, um, uh, leaned on the side of, you know, uh, in favor of Congress. And so it wasn't. The it wasn't that they that they had a. It wasn't that at this point in 1776 that the Congress is angry at Benedict Arnold, or he's done something that darkened his reputation. It's more just the bureaucratic tangle there. Yeah. And, and uh, that was, at least that was the excuse that was given if there was things going on behind the scenes. And as I say, the, his enemies were busy behind the scenes and, and were much more politically adept than Arnold ever was. Uh, so there might have been, you know, word was being passed around in Congress, but um, if it was, it's, it's, all, it's not really in the historical record. But he, uh, Arnold threatens to resign, right? And... and he did resign, yes. Yeah, and right. uh, in uh, July, uh, it was February of um, of uh, seventeen seventy seven that he they refused to promote him, and he mulled it over for quite a long time. Finally, and he didn't want to resign because he loved the military. I mean, he that right. he found himself in the military, and he found that he had this tremendous gift for fighting. He loved to be in the action. He he he. He was he just flowed through the action, so he didn't want to resign, but he felt he had to. So he went uh, went down to Philadelphia and handed in his resignation. Coincidentally, the same day, 
that news arrived in Philadelphia that Ty, Fort Ticonderoga had fallen, that uh, General Burgoyne was on the march towards uh, Albany. Right. Um, and so that uh, raised, when it came to the Battle of Saratoga, it raised a, uh, a kind of thorny issue that a lot of historians latched onto was, did, was he in the army then, or was right. had he resigned? And that it wasn't. It was. It was. There was no answer to that question. Uh, his resignation hadn't been accepted, but it, he hadn't uh, taken it back either. So it was just yeah. floating there. And uh, some some historians said, well, he didn't have any command in Saratoga because he was um, had resigned from the Continental Army. Well, we're going to get to the Battle of Saratoga in a minute. I want to remind everybody that we're chatting here today with Jack Kelly. I found the cover of your book there on my Thank computer. Uh, Jack Kelly, author of God Save Benedict Arnold, The True Story of America's Most Hated Man. Uh, and uh, But before we get to Saratoga, uh, I want to talk about uh, Valcor Island, at least briefly. And um, I lead a going to advertise the Boston Quebec Revolutionary War tour here. And um, I think that that we when when we start talking about the Battle of Valcour Island, I, I think that's where people's minds start expanding a little bit or blowing a little bit, because here you have the story of Benedict Arnold as an admiral. Okay, he's not actually an admiral, but he is commanding a fleet. Okay, it's a small fleet of small gunboats, but he's still, he's a naval commander on Lake Champlain in um, 1776, and most people know very little about that. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going on there and what happens at the Battle of Valcour Island? Yeah, as part of part of the capture of Fort Ticonderoga, the, the um, really two years previously in 1775 he had also also captured a british warship that was up on um, on lake champlain and so the the patriots controlled lake champlain with the they had a few other boats with cannon on them so when burgoyne came down with his force of 7000 men he wasn't able to transport them down to try to uh, besiege fort tacanaroga because these american gunboats were on the lake so the British had to build their own fleet uh, to take care of the gain control of the lake. Uh, there's a, a very and the Americans sluggish, are building more gunboats at the same and, time, and, right? And, it's and, like right under under Arnold's uh, direction. Um, direction. They're, they're they're down at the southern end of the lake building more gunboats. Not not big boats, but they're, they're they had some pretty powerful cannon on them. And the, there's a, a very sluggish river that goes out the north end of Lake Champlain um, that has rapids in it. So you, you can't sail from uh, the St. Lawrence River up into uh, Lake Champlain, which if the British had been able to do that, they could have brought up a huge number of warships and easily taken over the lake. But they had to put together their own ships uh, above those rapids. And they did w w month after uh, week after week and then month after month they were building these ships the whole uh summer of 1776 went by arnold went up to the with his small fleet waited around uh uh put in the harbor uh, in the the bay between valcour island and the new york shore uh just to get some protection from the storms on the lake and um then the British came down on October 11th and fought the battle that you see there, where the top line of ships is uh, the Americans. And the British, uh, because there were shoals in the top of that, what looks like a strait there, but you couldn't sail in from the north. So the British had to come around from the south, and their, their bigger ships weren't able to tack enough to get in against the wind. And the wind was the against bay. them, right? Yep, yep. So they had the they had gunboats which were road boats and they some of them had twenty four pounder cannon on so they were not they were pretty powerful uh, uh, fire for firepower and the the battle was mainly between the American gunboats and the British gunboats and it went on for seven hours just firing point blank range back and forth um, a lot of the um, American boats were damaged uh, some of the British boats were sunk and um, Arnold then was able to escape 
in the middle of the night and then quietly sneak through the British lines. There was more fighting down the lake and most of the American fleet was destroyed. Uh, but um, the outcome really was that the British, uh, by the time they got down to uh, besiege uh, Ticonderoga, and they did br bring their and their army down, uh, it was too late in the season, uh, and they were afraid that Lake Champlain would freeze, and then they'd be stuck there, and they would uh, be stranded. So they decided to wait until the following year. So, I mean, in large measure, then, you, you can say that Benedict Arnold kind of saved the northern flank of the army, right? Uh, yeah, uh, not only did he do that, but he did it at a time when George Washington was uh, really getting his worst beating of the entire yeah. war around New York. So it right. was doubly important for that reason that uh, uh, Washington was not only pushed out of New York, but he was now over in Pennsylvania. So. Yeah. So Okay, so Rick, where, where are we? Chris, your, it's your turn. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, we we you know we can go back we... to Saratoga if you want. No, yeah. I said yeah. I think we should 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 move on to Saratoga. So yeah, he you know so we've talked about Valcor Island. Um, he's a little upset that he didn't get his promotion, and uh, we don't know if he's in the army or he's not in the army. Uh, but I think certainly one of the moments that he's most famous for, and I I find really compelling, is is his part in the Battle of Saratoga because obviously. Um, in fact, the cover of your book is of his action there during that right. battle. So maybe we we should talk a little bit about you know kind of his role and how important it is uh, to arguably one of America's greatest victories during the Revolution. Yeah, the the, the battle which we call the Battle of Saratoga is really in two parts. And uh, the the first um, attempt by Burgoyne to the uh, General Gates was in overall command and. Um, uh, Arnold was one of his subordinates, and Arnold was in, in charge of the left wing of the American lines. Uh, they'd built fortifications up on the high ground, and uh, uh, General Burgoyne had to somehow find a way to get around them in order to get to Albany. He tried uh, attacking on the American and going around the left end of the American lines, and, and they fought a battle on September 19th. And it was a very hard fought and well managed battle in which uh, Arnold's division stopped Burgoyne on the field and uh, inflicted pretty heavy casualties. Burgoyne claimed to have won that battle just on the technicality that they held the battlefield, but he had really, he, and, and they admitted that they had, it, it was a very costly victory for them. Um, then there was a, a pause for a couple of weeks while Burgoyne hoped that someone would send him help, but it never did. And um, it was during that time that uh, Gates and Arnold had a had a, a dispute about uh, uh, Arnold felt that he didn't, didn't uh, Gates had not given him enough credit when he wrote up the account of the battle. That dispute became a very hot. Uh, topic in the history of the battle ever since. Uh, its significance is, um, I think, overblown totally. Um, and when the second battle came, um, it, it unfolded pretty much the way you would expect it. Uh, again, Gates was in overall command. Arnold was in command of the left wing, managed the battle, defeated Burgoyne, and then in that picture you showed uh, depicts Arnold uh, charging into the British field fortifications. In this case, this was actually a Hessian uh, redoubt that, that they broke into and um, broke through the British lines or the enemy lines. And uh, Burgoyne, and then at that point, had to retreat and and finally had to surrender his entire army. Benedict Arnold was severely wounded in that battle, but um, the fact that he managed the battle has been disputed by almost every uh, account of the Battle of Saratoga that, that, that took away his credit. And he was said to be drunk, which was uh, really an absurdity. Uh, he was sulking in his cabin. He'd been relieved of his command by Gates. The, he and Gates were still, you know, uh, uh, in the in a dispute uh, and Gates wouldn't give him command of his own 
of the troops in the left division. All that, all those stories um, were designed to take away Benedict Arnold's credit for the success of the what was, you know, many people refer to as the turning point at battle of the war. Well, and we 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 talked about this a little bit uh, um, um, on Friday when we had a brief conversation with you. Um, and there's a there's a, a letter, the Nathaniel Bachelor letter that came out uh, uh, was. I think it's three or four years old. I mean, it's 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 two hundred <laughs> something years old, but I think it uh, it has been kind of in the in the in the public eye for for a few years, which which basically puts the lie to Arnold sulking in his cabin or uh, being drunk or whatever. Can you tell us a little bit about what it says? Yeah, that that was a, a letter from a uh, New Hampshire militiaman to his wife, written two days after the war. Uh, th this. Uh, two days after at, the battle, right? Uh, two days after the uh, the end of the battle, um, of the um, this uh, militiaman bachelor was in had some clerical duties in headquarters, so he was privy to conversations between Arnold and General Gates, and the conversations were not extraordinary; they were just exactly what you would expect if they were uh, both. Uh, cooperating entirely to try to win the battle, and um, it gave, but it gave the lie to all these stories that Arnold wasn't in command, that he'd been relieved of his command, that he was uh, somehow uh, deranged or, or whatever the stories have been down the years. Um, it, it, you can't say it's proof positive of anything, but it certainly was a strong indication, and I think um, many of the historians that I've talked to have agreed that it, it really slants or you know pushes the narrative much more towards uh, Arnold's um, heroism at Saratoga and his you know he was the essential man there yeah okay so, so Jack I mean in the interest of time I mean I, everybody's gonna we're gonna there is that little matter uh oh of there's the, a touch here yeah yeah that we should probably get to so um he's wounded at Saratoga he's got to recover from his wounds um, there's more debate about him not getting credit. And, 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 and so it seems as if. But he gets his rank over, restored. Yep, yep. But it seems but, like he's on easy street. Everything's right. good to go. So, but where does this all start to turn? And where do you think. This well, certainly, to... you know, m many people have pointed out that uh, uh, George Washington was really a very brilliant um, manager of military affairs and who to put where and how to when you know to, who to promote and what assignments to give him but he had one glaring error and that was to send Benedict Arnold uh, still sort of hobbling along on his wounded leg to Philadelphia in a in a, a position that called for diplomacy Arnold was the worst person they could possibly and it seemed like it would have been obvious to Washington by that point, but sure. he sent him down there to be an administrator of the transition from Philadelphia back from British control to American control and civil, civilian control. And um, it was the wrong place. And, and, and Arnold got into a sort of uh, petty corruption of using government wagons and and um, making profits uh, which was his natural thing to do as a businessman is like uh, and I think he sort of reverted to that uh, he got in with a lot of loyalists or former loyalists or or fence sitters mostly uh, the Shippen family which he then married the daughter of Peggy Shippen um, and step by step, whether he sat around thinking too much, uh, what exactly the process was, uh, that suddenly he decided that he could end the war by uh, going over to the British. And that and they started that plot. And it really went on then for, I think, about 16 months he was plotting before he actually put it into practice of the that it, he tried to give over the fort at, um, at West Point, but um, 
why did he do it is that is the that's the sixty thousand dollar question yeah. yeah exactly and we and, didn't have the budget yeah so, <laughs> so <laughs> yes for an answer. you got to buy the book in front of um so uh, kind of adding to that and rick i'm going to jump in here but um we wow. had a question right. for, uh, from a uh, francine miller you oh. touched on this a little bit but she would like to know can you speak about the influence of benedict arnold's wife peggy do you think if he hadn't married her he would have acted treasonously and and also talk about her awesome hair. Yes, yeah, right. And, and this yeah. this is actually a uh, portrait of uh, Peggy that was drawn by Major John Andre at the time oh. when the British were in control of Philadelphia, and Peggy was flirting with the uh, with the British officers. Uh, and those hairdos were that is that's the type of hairdo they had back then. Wow. And. Um, whether she, whether he would have gone over to the British, I, I, I don't, I can't give her enough. Uh, I can't give her all the credit, though. She was in on the plot from the beginning. She was sort of a go between between him and uh, and Major Andre, who was the head of British intelligence. Uh, so her role was big enough that it it certainly raises questions of how much influence she had in in making in pushing him to make the decision. But it's hard to imagine him, and particularly the, given the the influence of, that women had back then, that that she made the decision for him. I just I, I don't I don't see that in his personality that he would have been open to that. He decided for himself what he wanted to do. I don't think. Well, and and you said that you know he thought he was going to end the war. He finalizes his treason in September 1780, it's pretty late. The war has been going on for five years. The public opinion in Britain has turned against it. The Americans are a couple of weeks away from winning at King's Mountain, a couple of months away from winning at Cowpens. Uh, his timing is really bad. Is, is it, can he not see that? Or is he just so far in by that point that he has no choice but to keep going. That, that's a that's a, a very difficult question, Rick. I, I, you know, some people would say 1780 was a bad year for the Patriots, and in that way, it kind of looks like Arnold might have been jumping to the winning side. But on the other hand, he had started the plot many months before when there was no the British were not have it didn't seem to have a particular advantage back in 1779 and so that wasn't that didn't seem to to make sense that he was just jumping on the on the winning side um and what he felt about it and what you know how that uh, whole dynamic played out of uh where the war was going is is it's mysterious uh, you know it's uh, we I, need to I've discover the hidden it. letters that we don't or the diary <laughs> yeah, that, that someplace <laughs> it expresses his thoughts because as you pointed out that well we'll, we'll hand it over to chris but but when he defended his his treason it wasn't even him that wrote it it was somebody else uh, who wrote it so he we don't really know what he thought yeah the, the, uh, the go ahead, go ahead. Uh, yeah. it's, like, yeah, it's, it's kind of in the same vein you know one of the charges that's very often leveled against him as he did it for money. Um, but as you point out several times in the book, he basically bankrupted himself, you know, in, in the in the Patriot cause. And he, you know, he sacrificed his business. He paid, for, you know, provisioning his men, et cetera. So do, do, I, I know we don't know definitively, but since you spent so much time with him, is, is, is it simply money? Is there more to this? Is there something else that's driving this? And, and also, how does he think that his act is going to actually end the war? Well, that uh, the, the, both of those are very good questions. I, I, I think I've, I kind of rejected the, the, the idea that it was all, all about money. I think money had a, probably certainly played a role because he had the mind of a businessman. And that's definitely true. And... Um, but he had, like I say, he had spent his own money uh, paying his troops. He had uh, laid out money for equipment. He didn't. He never got repaid everything that he had had even put into the war. Uh, like many officers, didn't get a, his pay on time or at all. Um, even after he began making the plot, 
he was giving money to the children of Joseph Warren, uh, who yeah. had been left orphans because Warren had been kill, kill it, um, at the Battle of Bunker Hill. Uh, and Arnold thought that Congress wasn't doing enough for these kids, and he, he handed out his own money f to them to get them an education. So the idea that he was such a so money hungry that he was uh, willing to, to throw away his entire uh, commitment to the cause for that reason uh, didn't really make sense right. to me. Um, right. I, 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 I think that we can, you know, I, I speculate and I always say, you know, uh, offer that this is total speculation. I don't yeah. have evidence of it. He was a narcissist and he loved to be at the middle of everything. And he maybe he wasn't about to end the war, but he imagined he was because he was going to be the man in who, who was uh, affecting everything. And that was very appealing to him. He was also risking his life again um, by going over to the British. And, but you know, you know, if word had leaked out uh, from British headquarters that he was uh, negotiating with them, he would have been arrested and hanged. So he realized that, and it was, I don't say he did it in order to feel the excitement, but it, that he felt that kind of excitement, that sense that he was, he was the man that was going to do it. Put everything. him in the middle again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that made it feel right to him. For whatever reason, he ultimately, you know, originally pushed him to do it. Uh, it felt right while he was plotting and uh, up until the time that. Well, and we have uh, one of our viewers, Lynn Hargrove, asks about, uh, he says, it sounds as if Arnold had uh, somewhat of an inferiority complex, maybe from his harsh childhood. I mean, it, we're not trying to put the psychologist hat on you here, Jack, but do you think there's there's anything to that possibly as well? Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't call it an inferiority complex. Uh, I think that there was a, an acute sensibility uh, when his father became a, a, an alcoholic and he was sent out a very searing duty for a 14-year-old kid to go out and collect your father's leg drunk on the street, it was the contempt that the people of the town, and they lived in a small town and, and went to the small town church, and the people there had contempt and, and ridiculed his father. That's what really pissed him off. And he was then acutely sensitive to any slight, any um, uh, stain, that he, what he felt was a stain on his honor. So that was certainly, I think, pretty definitely a, a trait that he did carry over from childhood. You want to ask a question, Rick, or are you going to go? Uh, I, I was but... going to let you ask, but I have a no, question. No, 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 no. I don't have one. I'm, no, no, I do. I haven't I, run yeah. out yet. Okay. No, I, I mean... This is this is um, you know we're kind of moving forward here, and um, I'm sure a little controversial. But uh, since you know many many years have passed, I think it's fair to say that there people are starting to take a more nuanced look at the revolution and to consider the views of the loyalists uh, and all of the you know mm. you have the idea that it was a civil war and what have you. But Benedict Arnold is still that traitor, Benedict Arnold. It doesn't matter, you know. Um, and you know, you 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 raise the issue in the book, and I think it's a kind of a valid point. Why is it that now, so many years after, Benedict Arnold is still a traitor, and he's called a traitor by we're not going to argue about the rights or wrongs of the cause by a bunch of people who were traitors. Um, so, well, no, I mean, okay, not, fair I, enough, fair enough. They took up arms against their government, sure, right? Sure. Okay, so that's but I'm not arguing about the rights or wrongs of the cause, but. So Arnold commits this act of treason, uh, but but he's forever blackened, whereas other people, let's just say when America has its own civil war, those guys don't kind of carry that. They get statues all around. Yeah. I mean, some of them are coming down, but a lot of them are still up. Again, I'm not, I'm not you know, the, the argument about rights and wrongs of that is the whole separate book, but why do you think it is that Arnold just stays as the ultimate Bad guy. There's no, no there's no subtlety or nuance. To that. I I think it really it began pretty much the day that his his treason was uncovered. It was the it was a shock to the country, and it, 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 I mean I think people are absolutely flabbergasted, and they turned that in. And there's accounts from contemporary times of exactly this. They turned it into a hatred of Benedict Arnold that was has really just 
echoed down the centuries. Uh, the effigies of him that were burned, it was like he became the focus of, um, of, of a, the, the national stress coming out as hatred of Benedict Arnold. And it, it never happened that what he expected, which was many officers would follow him, he seemed to seemed to at least believe that that was the case. Expected when he went over, they'd all come over, and right. that that would be part of the way that he would end the war was not just by giving over West Point, but the the, the Continental Army of sort of following him into the into the uh, into the British side. So when that didn't happen. Um, and I did, you know, it, it, it made, made him the sole focus. And so the early biographies of Arnold were very uh, negative and, 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 uh, and came up with a lot of just uh, arbitrary stories about him that made him put him in a bad light and t tore down what he actually did do for the Patriot cause because they couldn't admit that he was a hero. Now it was made more sense if he was just, he'd been a secret, uh, Tr uh, traitor all along we, and that's that was a story that uh has never really gotten out of the historical record uh right. though it's certainly a lot of the the more recent biographies are much more balanced of course right. well jack kelly thank you so much for joining us today on history happy hour and talking about your book god save benedict arnold the true story of america's most hated man i enjoyed it immensely and uh you know i think it's a great book for people to take a look at not a hard read at all so definitely uh worth spending a little time on thank you so much for joining us today we really appreciate it okay thank you rick and chris uh, it's Thanks, been chris. a pleasure as usual all right great. and, and, and you, two, in two or three years we'll see you again okay <laughs> <All right. laughs> Thanks, thank Dad. you so much uh so yeah it's a it's a it's interesting that it's just so um it, it it it's a question like the why question, right? You know what's, so what was in his head. It, it's it's uh, it to me it's endlessly fascinating. Absolutely, and these people will keep writing about him and trying to figure out why he did what he did. Uh, and maybe we can have more of them on the show. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. But next week, next week, we're going back to World War II. There we go. Our guest is Peter Harmson. He's the author of Darkest Christmas, December 1942 and A World at War. This is an author we tried to have on with another book a couple of years ago. It, and timing didn't work out, but now we're going to get him on. Uh, and this is our last live interview in a month because Chris will be traveling in the Pacific and I'll be headed to D.C. Uh, so, you know, join us and, and then keep joining us for the Encore episodes. But definitely join us next week. Yep, and, so, and uh, I'm going to, uh, when I'm out in the Pacific, I'm going to uh, see our friend Don Farrell, who I know a lot of people oh, love nice. on show and see if I can convince Don to come back on. Well, and and post some photos. I know you'll be posting a lot on your own page, but post a few in the History Happy Hello. Hour Facebook page so we can follow along with what you're doing. And uh, as you as you uh, we, we we say Ewo, but you're not actually going to Ewo, but to the other uh, specific uh, places that you're going, so we can follow along with the action there. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for joining us. Please subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook. Uh, shout at us on Twitter. Uh, listen to our podcast. Back us on Patreon and browse historyhappyhour.com. Thanks, everybody. Be safe.